when we were driving back from Indianapolis today, we were chatting, and she sort of confessed that when she went to Washington, she thought it was only going to be for a year or two. But now she is starting her 10th year there, and it all sounds exciting and interesting and even maddening working with our legislators to promote library interest. Her topic is very timely tonight. It's the Library Outlook from Capitol Hill. May I present Ms. Eileen Cook. I came well supplied with some handouts here. I've done this according to instruction now. Can everybody hear me all right? Fine. Well, I must say it's a real delight to be here at a more reasonable hour. Last night I broke up the meeting with the state librarians going on midnight and we reconvened for a 7.30 breakfast meeting. So this is getting to be something of a, a marathon day, but I've been looking forward to this day for over a year. And uh, in the last few weeks, with some trepidation, wondering what tricks Congress might be up to. Uh, we're all engaged in a, a guessing game of sorts, trying to decide whether Congress is going to get the upper hand or the administration in the year ahead, and indeed for the four years ahead. Therefore, we've entitled this talk the Library Outlook from Capitol Hill, and it should be a uh, a forewarning, the recognition that there's really no assurance that any predictions that are made in Washington or indeed any place in the country are very likely to come out even with the most experienced speaker and observer of goings on in Washington and on Capitol Hill. All of the Old ideas are being thrown out the window. Congress, as you know, has been reorganizing itself. There's a, definitely a new tone that's come on the scene. Committee hearings are, for practically the first time in history, generally open to the public. There are some exceptions, but it's a whole new era, and the congressmen and their staffs that formerly have been used to working behind closed doors are finding it uh, a new and I think sometimes uh, worrisome experience not knowing quite how to conduct themselves under the, the heat of television lights and knowing they're going to be faithfully recorded and uh, taken apart in the press sometimes, as you know. And as you know also, the news, at least for the last several months, has been dominated by the administration, the re-election of the president, and his obvious determination to reconstitute his own cabinet structure and the way the administration is going to work under his four years ahead. And this is to be expected with Congress in an adjournment period. The president naturally has uh, the upper hand, and I think he uh, displayed this to a, a large extent over the latter fall months and in the beginning of the new year. However, now Congress has been back in session for approximately two and a half months. They reconvened January 3rd. And during the last couple months, most of their activities have been sort of low level because they are reorganizing themselves as a new Congress, the 93rd Congress. This is the first session. If you all know, Congress, a single Congress stays uh, in session and then adjourns and comes back for a second session, the second year, and it's still the same Congress. All bills are still alive, as they say, until the two-year term is completed. Then any, pen any pending legislation dies and has to be reintroduced. And that is the case with many of the bills that we covered in the last couple of years that were of major consideration for librarians, for example, the copyright legislation, the Older Americans Act, those of you that were interested in working with senior citizens, and uh, the Higher Education Act, in fact, died a couple of years ago and was uh, reintroduced and 
Hat, I think, was one of the uh, most historic bills in terms of uh, ongoing activity. But in any case, it gets to be a very complex picture in trying to keep track of what Congress is doing and what the administration may be doing in opposition. And this, of course, uh, varies from one period in history to another, depending on the principal fact of whether the administration is of the same party as the Congress. And when they are, things seem to flow fairly smoothly. There's always a certain contention between the uh, president and Congress, but when they're of uh, opposite parties, uh, you can expect the battle lines to be formed quite frequently. And that, as you know, has been the case in the last four years. In this new section, or new period of President Nixon's, uh, it's going to say reign, um, <laughs> In his new pres uh, term of presidency, he has kind of switched signals, and everybody is at a loss for what he's going to do next. And I think he's enjoying it thoroughly. Uh, up until this last year, he was uh, giving the cabinet members a fairly loose rein, but at the same time, he was uh, calling conferences and acting with outside groups. Uh, much speculation was taking place whether he was uh, just campaigning or not. But this new year now has brought about a whole change of atmosphere in as much as he has uh, redeployed his White House staff to various agencies. And what this is now showing up as is a, a tightening of his reign on the whole executive branch, He's trying to gather forces so that the policies he establishes will be carried out. There, as you know, is always a certain amount of push and shove between career-type uh, bureauc bureaucrats and the presidency. And I think this is one of the sad lessons that many presidents learn, that no matter what their grand plan is, they don't always get to carry it out because the uh, bureaucratic level is interposing things that were in place before that particular president came along. So this all adds to the consternation of the uh, lobbyists, as uh, we are called, and rightly so, since we are registered to be uh, able to go to hearings and uh, work with our members. One of the things that is very obvious in Congress is that it is definitely becoming more liberal, while at the same time, the executive branch is showing a definitely more conservative strain. And one very tangible uh, element to keep in mind is that the average age in the Senate alone has been reduced by 22 years as a result of the last election. So with all of the people trying to speculate as to what is going to happen, uh, there are some very solid facts that point to the, the uh, future of increasing liberalism and this is not in a political sense, but just the idea of the age element, the whole Legislative Reorganization Act is opening up Congress. I think there's going to be a decided change with uh, the voter feeling that he's getting a better insight into what is going on in Congress. And meanwhile, along with that, the conflict between the President and Congress is increasing day by day. And as you read the paper, you will recognize that the principal issue that's coming to the foreground is the issue of impoundment and executive privilege. And this is where we're having our biggest problem in the education field now because of the labor HEW bill that was twice vetoed last year. And as you know, Congress has just decided to wash its hands of the whole issue of writing a third labor HEW bill, since it's so late in the session, we only have about three months to go in this fiscal year. And so they have now, just in the last 10 days, decided to extend what they call the continuing resolution. And formerly, this was known as a stopgap money bill, meant to just tide agencies over until a regular bill was enacted. This year, it's going to be in effect for the entire year. And uh, having just met with your 
state librarians from uh, about 37 of the 50 states. There is great concern because programs that have been deferred all year with the hope that Congress would finally come up with what might be a fairly adequate budget for the rest of the year has now been pretty well closed off and uh, even though this was the first day of spring and we were saying we're still hopeful, we don't yet know what the administration is going to do in terms of releasing fourth quarter money. And those of you who don't work with federal programs may not realize how horrendous this can be when you have staff members who are waiting to know whether they're going to be uh, laid off or projects that have been going along at a, a very minimal level with the hopes that they might get a, a new uh, transfusion of funds to keep them alive and viable, outreach programs that are now going to have to be curtailed or closed down altogether. And we have been trying to acquire some what we call solid data. There's a great deal of speculation when you're in a, an interim or a stopgap money period where you're wondering what your funding is going to be. And so we've been trying to gather rough estimates to base our 1974 appropriations testimony on. And just in some preliminary figures, we are hearing things like 2,000 librarians may be laid off by July 1 if adequate funds are not available in this last quarter to make up for the deficiency in the first three quarters of the year. Then, I don't know how many of you looked over the President's budget that was released January 29th, but if you did, you know very well that all of those library programs that we have been uh, basing our hopes and plans for the future on have great big fat zeros after them in the budget. And those of you who may have read about some of the midwinter activities of the American Library Association in Washington in January know that we had a congressional luncheon. Many members of Congress and senators and their staff came to that. It was very successful. Those members who couldn't take time out because they were in session that day or had hearings uh, were visited at some time during the week by the librarians and trustees. And in many instances, the congressman said, now, what's this you're saying? The president's budget has zeroed out libraries. Come now, you can't be. You Let's take a look at the budget here. This can't be why those are good programs. And invariably, they'd open up the budget and find, sure enough, there were zeros. And there's no explanation. The one we hear is that some of these programs have outlived their usefulness. And the one we hear about the Library Services and Construction Act, if you can believe it is that it's been so successful, it's no longer needed. Or that revenue sharing will solve all those problems. And so we have all of these issues in causing great turmoil as we're getting into the 74 budget hearing stage now. And uh, while I came here with a prepared speech to give, because they wanted it in advance, I hope that we can have a few moments for questions and answers and that you will be interested in the, the budget outlook. Just in case you think this is all gloom and doom, I should tell you the host for our breakfast meeting this morning was Carl Perkins, the chairman of the House Education Labor Committee. And he had his state librarian, Margaret Willis, from Kentucky there at his side, and he said, I want all of you good people out there to know, he said, that I have every hope, in fact, he said, I'm quite confident that Congress isn't going to get, let this happen to libraries. We're going to fund those libraries, maybe not at the level we'd really like to see them funded, but he said, those are good programs. And he said, I've been around here since 1949. He looked at me and he said, I know Ms. Cook's been here for a while, but he said, I came here in 49 before you had a Library Services Act. And he said, we were mighty proud of getting that bill through. He said, we struggled for years and years. And he said, I remember once we lost just by two votes. But he said, uh, Julia Bennett was in the Washington office then. And she was a mighty fine woman, he said. And uh, she just stuck around and saw that we got that first rural library bill. And he said, that did more for the people of this country. And you could just see he was so swept up with remembering all of this and really so enthusiastic about what 
the Rural Library Services program meant to him. And he had two of his staff men there, and he was going on. He said, and then Jerry Credit came along just about the time we got that bill written into law. I guess Julia thought she'd done her job. She went off and got married to some fancy lawyer, but he said. And we had Jerry, and she's done a marvelous job, but now she's left. And he said, I know Miss Cook's going to carry on. And I couldn't help but remember when the budget came out during our midwinter meeting. We had a little reception for Miss Credick with Senator Pell acting as the host. And someone asked him if he'd mind saying a few words. And he said, well, he said, we certainly want to wish Miss Credick well. She's done a fine job here. She can be proud of this. And then he turned to me, like the poor orphan child, and he said, in now with all those zeros in the budget, he said, you ought to just take the consolation here that you have no place to go but up. <laughs> so I tried to remember that this morning as Carl Perkins was speaking. And uh, he went on getting more enthusiastic about this and seeing all the librarians out there nodding their heads, agreeing with him, remembering some of them had been there all the while through the agony of getting that first, what they called a demonstration bill through when it was in its formative stage. Uh, I should go back and mention that the Washington office of ALA opened in October of 1945, and it took 10 years to get that first little rural library bill with an authorization of $7.5 million. And now, in fiscal year 1972, we had $58.7 million appropriated for LSCA, as we call it now, the Library Services and Construction Act, and um, 90 million for Title II of ESCA, which is the school library program, and 15 million for the Higher Education Act. Altogether, it added up to approximately 165 million in actual funds going out to libraries of all kinds and for training of librarians and for library research and demonstration. So I think we have to keep remembering this and remembering, too, that we can't expect things to continue on the way they have. Congress is changing. The executive branch is changing its style. And perhaps we need to look ahead and think of some new kinds of programs. Maybe uh, after some thought, we will decide that what we have is really pretty good. Maybe it needs a new name. Maybe it needs some new trappings or elements that we haven't considered before. But in any case, uh, keep in mind we've got Carl Perkins, the chairman of the House Education Labor Committee. And as he went on getting more and more uh, roiled up over the fact that the administration was zeroing out libraries and that anybody could possibly think of this, he said, why? He said, I'm just so sure the Appropriations Committee is going to put some money back in there. But he said, let me tell you, before I leave you to go off and do your lobbying, you're not going to come to Washington without visiting your members now. He said, before I leave you, I'm going to promise you, if they don't do it, he said, I'm going to get up on the floor of the House and offer that amendment that's going to put the money back in. And you know, at that point, the House came down and Mr. Perkins left. He had a, a hearing to... Uh, consider a five-year extension of the Elementary and Secondary Education Act. And I wanted to share all of this with you because I think sometimes we go from day to day reading the headlines in the paper and poring over the congressional record as we do in, on the Hill, and we think, well, it's the same old routine. But when you get a chance to meet with the people who are administering the programs and meet with the congressmen who are in there from day to day going all over the bills line by line and all really what is sheer drudgery at times. You wonder if it has any meaning, meaning at all. Uh, then you get this combination, putting it all together and seeing the people that it is helping, the letters that are just pouring into the office. Sometimes I think uh, some of the people think I'm a congressman. I've got, uh, well, a large stack of letters just from Arkansas alone from people who are benefiting from the part of the Library Services and Construction <coughs> Act that complements the Library of Congress program for the books for the blind and the handicapped. And they're writing very heartfelt letters, some in very cryptic, cryptic, cryptic handwriting. Some uh, say, I'm having my friend type this. And what they're saying is, this program is life to me. I don't get out of the house. I'm crippled or I can't see. I have talking books. 
And when you get things like this, you decide it's worth getting up at 6 o'clock in the morning for a 7.30 breakfast or staying up till midnight and trying to convince our friends out there that it's important to keep the letters coming into Congress and to keep digging for hard facts because the main thrust of my speech here is to point out that we have a, a new secretary of HEW and as many of you know, his name is Casper Weinberger. He has just recently come from the Office of Management and Budget, and over there he was called Cap the Knife. His job was to cut out the fat out of programs. And he's uh, thought of as the axe wielder and all sorts of nasty things like that. But what we hear on the other side, that he's really not a bad guy and that what he demands from his staff at all level is hard data and that he will listen to reason and I'd like to give him the benefit of a doubt and what we have to do is come up with harder facts, uh, less projections, less speculation and assumption and if anybody can come up with the answer to how you cost out library programs, I'd love to know. I've had a man in the office visiting from the general accounting office. He said, you know, we're trying to do a study of how these library programs work. And he said, I've gone up to my library, and he said, it's pretty busy, but he said, I can't quite get a handle on this. And I said, well, brother, you and I are in the same boat, because I said there are, there are a lot of factors that you can take into consideration. But when you get right down to it, you have to realize that libraries have a humane aspect about them, that there's an element of uh, need for cultural enrichment, for recreation, and a lot of intangibles. And if you don't take those into consideration, uh, it's almost impossible to show that libraries balance out on a budget scale. And if you are dealing with that kind of a mentality to try to convince them of the, the essentiality of libraries and the significance of them, it's mighty hard to, uh, to make a really strong case. But I'm not ready to admit to defeat, and I hope that all of you out there feel the same way, that we can come in with some really significant and telling data that will convince the people who are now in the administrative strata that are making the decisions that there must be a continuation of each of these library programs. Maybe they have to be targeted in a finer, narrower direction for a while till there are more funds available. But I think that we need to continue this. And with this in mind, I hope you'll take a hard look at your own congressional delegation. And you find that there are quite a few people that have been voting no very consistently on any programs to add more money to the budget. Mr. Dennis of this 10th district is one who uh, apparently has been impressed continuously with the need for holding the line on spending in every single bill that has to do with adding money for health, education, welfare in the last several years he has voted against. And this is not to say that he isn't doing what he think is proper, but I hope that you are making every effort to see that he gets the facts. This is all we can do is to put the facts before them and hopefully let the facts speak for themselves because uh, maintaining fiscal responsibility is one of the major concerns of Congress on both sides of the aisle, as they say, both the Democrats and the Republicans. I think many are now far more hopeful now that the Vietnam conflict is apparently abating and hoping there will be some free money. I think others of us are not so confident there will be that much free money and that we have to be very concerned and active to try to get whatever there is available put into the priority of health, education, and welfare, and in our case, particularly for education programs and library programs. This is uh, another element that we've had a time and a concern in trying to get the message across that when we speak as librarians and going to member of Congress, we can only speak from our particular area of expertise. When we try to get into other areas, you soon lose your credibility. And as a specific example, I recall sitting at a hearing that Mrs. Green had 
on the extension of the education, higher education legislation. And she stopped at one point and took a witness to task for uh, sort of going off on a tangent. And she said, you know, this reminds me, she said, I've been having so many college professors coming to me talking about the need for the extension of this program. And then they divert themselves into their own little favorite subject and go off and talk about the war or whatever. She was covering a variety of subjects. But she said, the minute they do that, it's obvious to me that they're here merely to seek the limelight. And they've lost all credibility with me. And I thought, we well, must remember that, because it is so easy to go off on a tangent, and as I'm doing with the speech tonight, and uh, when you are called to testify or to write a letter, what you need to do is to try to make it factual. And we hand out quite often at meetings something called the ABCs of dealing with Congress. And what that means is keep your statement, if you're going to visit a congressman, uh, your oral statement, or if you're writing something, your written statement, your letter, accurate and brief and clear. So we're talking about accuracy, brevity, and clarity. We have to remind ourselves all the time, although we're working at this and hopefully we're improving our style, is that these congressmen and senators particularly are very busy people, and many of them have several committee assignments. And so when they have an issue before them, such as they are uh, concerning themselves with now the 74 appropriation bill, they tend then and only then to want the information. So timing is terribly important. If you start talking to them about an appropriation bill in the fall, they're not going to be particularly interested. They're going to say, I'll keep your views in mind. But if you make it a point of becoming aware of what bills are before Congress and writing to them on those issues that you know are in the news that are concerning them most, they'll be most thankful. And what you can do is write a brief letter, tell them of your concern, and offer to give them more information. And if you're in uh, working in a capacity where you do have the facts on this, they'll welcome them. I think so many librarians and citizens in general really discount the value of a letter, or they've never really considered that it does carry a lot of weight with Congress. And we're finding that out right now in connection with the hearings on the labor HEW appropriation bill. We've heard just in the last week that the library mail is outrunning the impact aid mail. I don't know if you're familiar with the impact aid legislation, but it's money really without any strings attached that goes to the school districts that have federal installations in them. And the impact aid money goes to 385 congressional districts. So there is a great deal of support for this. And this gets around to another element that it's essential that you keep in mind, particularly at this time in history, the need to work with group effort coalitions. And those of you that have seen our newsletter this year will note that we've attached to, I think it was the second issue, came out February 9th, a resolution that was passed at our midwinter meeting that called for coalition activity. We are engaged in Washington in work that calls us for a 7.30 breakfast meeting at least once a week, sometimes a 5 or 6 p.m. meeting at the end of the day, to work with a group called the Committee for Full Funding. This started out in 1969 when we first had our first drastic cutback in the budget. And it was then called the Emergency Committee for Full Funding. And it was led by the former uh, staff assistant for Senator Wayne Morris on the Senate Education Committee. He was called back from his early retirement to help lead this group because he was so familiar with the education legislation, was so committed to it. But we decided we had a drastic situation, so we had the teachers and the guidance and personnel groups and a PTA and a real conglomerate of interests and concerns, thinking this would be perhaps a six month activity. And last year we decided to drop the emergency and just call it the Committee for Full Funding because we've been quite successful in getting money back into the budget, but it really is an ongoing uh, program and problem in as much as that it calls for continuing education 
you can't just take for granted because you've convinced Congress or the citizens who benefit from this that programs are in dire straits. You have to go back again and again. And this is true with all kinds of legislation. And we find this in ALA. We get a, a legislative uh, group from the various divisions, and they get very enthusiastic and knowledgeable. And then their term on committee uh, passes on, and another group comes along. And you have to start over and over. And if there is no simple way in dealing with legislation. There are no shortcuts. It gets very boring at times, tedious at times. And you have to keep remembering what the end goal is and what can be accomplished with citizen support. And in that connection, let me uh, digress even further, but really on the subject and the uh, area of citizen support. We had Ralph Nader coming to us at midwinter, which uh, did great things for my ego because I tried to get him several years ago and was told uh, as a National Library Week speaker, I tried to get him to come to a DC Library Association meeting and was told that he usually charges a thousand dollars and that he's almost inaccessible. So I gave up uh, early on there. Well, this time he called us and his contact man said, I. Mr. Nader doesn't usually do this, but uh, he'd like to come and talk to the librarians. And uh, so he said, uh, is there a possibility? And I said, well, I don't know. I said, we've got uh, really one evening that would be most appropriate, but we're, we're kind of booked up. I said, I'll have to see. I'll have to check with the other speakers. And I really, I wasn't putting them on, and I was concerned because... Uh, those of you that have read any accounts of the midwinter meeting, we had Dick Scammon, who's the NBC political analyst. He's a former director of the Bureau of the Census and is a political uh, light in his own uh, way and a very entertaining and perceptive speaker. And I was thinking, I wonder if there's anything between Nader and Scammon. Maybe Scammon doesn't like Nader, wouldn't this be horrible? So the temptation was to say, yes, bring him on, but I thought I'd better check with Dick. And we had Bill Small, vice president of CBS Washington News, going to talk principally on shield law and uh, concern of the press now, and then Charlie Lee, our own dear Charlie Lee, to talk about the need for coalition activity. And I thought, well, we've really got a full program, and I know they're great, but I don't want the audience to go to sleep sitting there for three hours instead of two. But uh, I checked with all of the program people, and they all said, fine. And Scammon's secretary said, I think Dick can hold his own. And she said, in fact, she shrieked to the phone. She said, are you kidding? Do you know how hard it is to get Mr. Nader? And I said, well, as a matter of fact, yes. But I said, I didn't want to say yes if it wasn't all right with Dick Scammon. So Mr. Nader did come as sort of a, a last-minute surprise element and was very uh, gratefully received, and he had some good words of counseling. But what his point was that you can't tell a story by yourself. You have to go out to the community. You have to convince the citizens of the community that it's their library, that libraries are important, that uh, information is important, and it's really... A, a vital element in their lives. And somehow or other, we've got to learn how to do this, and it isn't easy. You can take all the public relations courses, and you can work with people and think you've got them caught up in something, and then uh, it kind of trails off. So it, it's a very demanding kind of thing. It takes a lot of endurance and patience, and uh, sometimes, I guess, just uh, pure streaks of luck here and there. But I would say do look very carefully at the need and importance for public relation in any kind of activity that can help you build skills in this direction so that you can begin to reach out to people and bring them in to help you. If you don't have uh, PR sta talent on your staff or you don't have it yourself, Try to get those elements in the community that will help you do the job. And this was the point that Ralph Nader made that night. He said, what you've got to do is, he said, why don't you go and get 
one of the biggest PR firms you can to help you tell the stories. He said, libraries are so important. And he went back to say what it meant to him in his life to have a library and how he got started as a, a very young child going with his mother and just kind of browsing around and coming upon things by chance. And we all know that, that public relations is vital, but I think we, we forget it every once in a while and we take for granted what we're doing. And this is another thing that's one of my pet hobby horses to ride that I think so often the people who are really doing the most exciting things are so busy doing it and taking it for granted that they really don't take time out to write it up, to take pictures, to send it off to the press or to call the press in. They just think, so oh, this is part of the job and, and right to read is an example. When that program was initiated by the administration, I think three quarters of the librarians in the country said so. What's new about the right to read? That's what we've been promoting all along, reading, libraries. Of course, everybody has a right to read. But, and incidentally, the legislation still hasn't been written. I think they're still looking for something to hang this on. And in that connection, I had a call from Senator Eagleton's office the other day saying they're going to hold hearings on it April 4th and 5th, and perhaps we'd like to file some testimony. And yes, indeed, we would. But it's a real problem this year because the school librarians are concerned about extension of the Elementary and Secondary Education Act. And do you give in to the temptation to hop on another bandwagon and say, yes, the right to read is our program, and uh, divert your attention from the need for getting support for the program you now have on the books? Or do you somehow juggle between these two or do you take another tact and say the right to read as it's being promoted now is seems to be a reading teacher's bill and it should be something that the teachers of reading and uh, reading tutors, uh, uh, people in the community that are involved in tutoring programs, this would be something they support and school librarians would only supplement, not only, but would supplement and uh, sort of backstop this effort. And it gets to be a real philosophical issue that you have to determine. And here's where we need the experts in the field of school librarianship. And we, it's great to be a generalist, but you have to have the experts too. So uh, I think when you're a student in library school, at least I had a real problem deciding what I wanted to do because it seemed to me librarianship was one of the most exciting fields because it just seems to transcend all knowledge and the whole world is yours and whatever your subject interests, you can uh, be a researcher, you can work with the public, you can cut across all lines and work in a small library, you can be a specialist. And it's a real problem deciding which one. And as you can see, I haven't decided yet. I'm still uh, sampling a little bit of this and that, but I'm meeting wonderful people who are specializing and we've got to have the specialists. So. I hope all of you don't decide to be generalists, but we do need those too. We need a, a good mix. Now getting back to the subject at hand here, the outlook from Capitol Hill. I think I've given you the, the inside look from Capitol Hill. But the outlook now is, again, getting back to the president and the issues that he wants to still push for this year and as we look at it, they seem to be pretty much the same issues he talked about last year in terms of executive reorganization, uh, kind of reconstituting the Department of Health, Education, and Welfare into a Department of Human Resources, and Castro Weinberger would be in charge of that if this comes about. On the other hand, you have Congress who's saying, what's wrong with what we have now? and for a very good reason on their part. The congressional committees are pretty much constituted on the basis of the cabinet structure. So if you start melding all of these things together, uh, you really don't have a rational reason for having the congressional committees uh, constituted the way they are. And so I think they're looking at it from that point of view as well as looking at it from 
uh, the legislative branch point of view saying who is the president to restructure everything as we've known it all these years. So uh, there are personalities involved. There are uh, long-time commitments involved by the senior members on committees who are uh, seriously questioning whether there needs to be a reconstitution of the cabinet structure. Then, along with this, as you all know, we have general revenue sharing, which has been very controversial. And is increasingly controversial as people are uh, deciding that they're not getting as much money as they thought they were going to get. Now that this law is already on the books, the president is about to resubmit his other special revenue sharing proposals. And in fact, one was just brought up to the Hill, as they say yesterday, Mr. Perkins hearing on the extension of ESEA, the Elementary and Secondary Education Act. Casper Weinberger at long last came forth with the administration's new proposal for special education revenue sharing. This year they're calling it the Better Schools Act. And uh, we've been waiting for weeks and weeks for this to be introduced because there's been so much publicity about this that I think some people feel that it's already on the books. And they're saying, well, why worry about Title II of ESEA? That's gone. We've got all those zeros in the budget. We've got special education revenue sharing, I guess. And I'm saying, no, you haven't. <laughs> Please keep fighting for Title II. And one of the reasons this has been so confusing is that the administration two years ago, when it first introduced this concept of special revenue sharing for various areas, uh, education being the one in our field, uh, they put what we call a, a road show together and sent it around the country. And they were touting the, the benefits of having this consolidation of education programs. And school libraries would indeed have been melded in with something called supportive services, where you have hot lunch, guidance and personnel, school libraries, equipment, and I um, can't remember the the other element then. In any case, there was no assurance after the first year that there would be any ongoing uh, school library program. There was uh, a hold harmless clause they referred to, but it only held harmless for one year. After that, all bets were off. There was a little tiny provision in the fine print that you have to learn to look at very carefully that said, funds could be transferred to other programs at the rate of 30 percent, and if the governor decided that uh, more was warranted, more indeed could be transferred, so you might be transferred right out of business. And these are the things that are so difficult and kind of boring at times. You think, there must be another way to find out about legislation, but there isn't. Believe me, there isn't. And if you don't take the pains to do this and just make up your mind that it's all worthwhile, uh, you lose everything because this is the way they do it. They bury the little tricks in the fine print. And if you're not alert to what the jargon means, you sit in meetings and you nod your head, yes, that sounds fine. And they tell you, well, we've got this whole harmless feature there. You don't have to worry. And in fact, I remember a a meeting where Jerry Credick sat in and Peter Muirhead, who was then the acting uh, commissioner of education or acting deputy commissioner, said, now I want you all that are worrying about these programs to just keep in mind we've got this whole harmless feature. And he said, uh, school libraries are taken care of there. He says, no problem. And he ticked all these things off. And then when he got through, he said, now are there any questions? And Jerry spoke up and she said, now, Peter, she said, I may be naive, but I'm not stupid. <laughs> and he looked at her, and she said, I can read just as well as you can, and that whole harmless applies for only one year. Well, this is exactly what needed to be said at every place they went around the country. But when they come out with one of these so-called road shows, they're, they're touting whatever the proposal is, and people haven't had an opportunity to study it, and they're not used to all of the... the jargon and so it's a you're working under a real disadvantage and that's why I say if you want to get into the, the legislative process there really isn't any shortcut and it's so essential that you do 
especially in this, at this period where categorical aid really is being looked at very closely. And the temptation is to say, do we really need all this red tape? Do we have to fill out all these forms? We know we need the money. Just send the money here and we'll put it to use. Well, this is all right where people are all of the same caliber and they all are agreed on their goals, but this gets to be a very political issue in some areas where it's a matter of uh, teachers, firemen, uh, salaries, uh, sewers, all of these things competing uh, that shouldn't ever be put together because uh, if a community needs a new sewage system, then it needs it. There shouldn't be any question. But it shouldn't be a matter of whether you have sewers or whether you have libraries. And, and this is the thing that's so frustrating under the, the general revenue sharing legislation that a certain amount of money is going back. And if you've been reading the paper, you find the mayors that were beating the drum loudest for this program a couple of years ago are now crying in Washington saying, we've been led down the garden path because we were told this was going to be new money. And what's happening is that it's not new money. It's supplanting what they were getting before under categorical aid. So I think you have to ask a lot of questions about legislation that's being proposed. And if you think this isn't your problem, this is all something that takes place in Washington and there are just a few people getting these dollars, keep in mind that Mr. Nixon proposed all this on the basis of returning power to the people. And when I heard that, I said, I remember something about power from my high school physics class. One form of power is heat, and that's what you're all going to get back there when you get those few dollars and only 25 programs competing for it. Instead of getting a dollar apiece under categorical aid, they're going to get 25 cents maybe, or maybe nothing at all if there isn't anything in the law that says so much shall go for this purpose. So this is what you're competing against now. And if money comes back with no strings, it's up for grabs, and whether it's the wheel that squeaks the loudest, or the person who's the smartest, or the one who burnt the midnight oil and did his homework and knows all the fine print, or whether it's a matter of your getting state legislation. And this is part of it, too. There are still about, I think, 16 states that have no kind of state aid for libraries. And this is something that has to be worked on. And I'm getting around to my sermon now. We had a midwinter meeting in Washington. We had a legislative workshop. And it wasn't just by coincidence that we did it, that it happened to be in Washington. It was all by devious plan. In fact, we started about three years ago trying to get funds for a workshop. And we couldn't quite manage it. So. We kept hammering away at it. We applied for J. Morris Jones Award. But the reason we went through all of that exercise was that we saw that some kind of revenue sharing was going to come. We saw that sooner or later, the mayors, the teachers, the librarians, and everybody else were going to be fed up, or so they think, with red tape and filling out paper and reading bills, say, just send us the money and we'll make the decision. And if that happens, you better have some legislative know-how at the state and local level because you're going to be in a continuous round of meetings trying to decide what's going to be done with the money. And you're also going to be called up more and more often about the need for support from your local citizenry for tax, increased taxes, for floating bond issues, for construction of libraries. And while that may seem all pretty deadly and dull, oil and did his homework and knows all the fine print, or whether it's a matter of your getting state legislation. And this is part of it, too. There are still about, I think, 16 states that have no kind of state aid for libraries. And this is something that has to be worked on. And I'm getting around to my sermon now. We had a midwinter meeting in Washington. We had a legislative workshop, and it wasn't just by coincidence that we did it, that it happened to be in Washington. It was all by devious plan. In fact, we started about three years ago trying to get funds for a workshop, and we couldn't quite manage it. So 
We kept hammering away at it. We applied for J. Morris Jones Award. But the reason we went through all of that exercise was that we saw that some kind of revenue sharing was going to come. We saw that sooner or later, the mayors, the teachers, the libraries, and everybody else were going to be fed up, or so they think, with red tape and filling out paper and reading bills. Say, just send us the money and we'll make the decision. And if that happens, you better have some legislative know-how at the state and local level because you're going to be in a continuous round of meetings trying to decide what's going to be done with the money, and you're also going to be called up more and more often about the need for support from your local citizenry for tax, increased taxes, for floating bond issues, for construction of libraries. And while that may seem all pretty deadly and dull, it's great when it puts up a new building or when it brings on a library specialist in an area you haven't had before or when you're able to uh, put a bookmobile out into an isolated area and find the people who are waiting there to greet you. And I worked on a bookmobile for several years, and I know what a great feeling it is even in a big city where the people don't have a library. Believe me, they don't take you for granted when you're there only a few hours. It isn't the same at all as being in a building where they might forget to come and they say, well, I can go at 9 o'clock tonight or I can go tomorrow. When you're in a bookmobile, and I've never been in a rural bookmobile, but I'm sure it's even more tremendous. I've heard a lot of stories about how they even bring pies and cakes. <laughs> but uh, it's an exciting kind of thing when you really have this feeling of going out to people and the see and being able to see that they really need you, that they think you're important. And this is something that we need to do in the cities by way of uh, experimentation with real information centers so that people get over the live idea that libraries are just storehouses or mausoleums or something for people who have leisure or really aren't pressed for information. And as you may know, Brooklyn Public Library finally got that Social Security money we've been reading about for so long. You may recall reading that uh, the whole New York system thought they were going to get 75 cents for every quarter they put in and under the Social Security program. And they were going to have a, a joint program for opening information centers based on their existing branches as well as opening some new storefronts. Only uh, it didn't quite work out that way. And then as you may know, last fall, Congress, with the president's urging, put a ceiling on the amount of dollars that go out into that program. So this may be the one and only, but it'll be a good experiment and a good demonstration of what can be done. And hopefully, the people of Brooklyn will find that these information centers are so important that they'll go to City Hall and demonstrate, picket whatever, knock the walls down to keep those libraries going. and improving and giving them the really vital kind of information they need to exist day by day for people who don't understand English, for people who can't read, and all of those other problems that are concomitant with a big city and with crime and with all of uh, the innumerable situations that come up in congested areas. And there should be comparable programs going on in other cities of other sizes geared to the needs of those citizens, and hopefully we can do this. And I'm really going to wind up now, believe it or not, and what I'd like to do is to recall for you and with you that we had a 1965 legislative workshop in Washington. And at that time, one of our principal speakers was Congressman John Fogarty. Those of you who've been around for a while, recall that John Fogarty was our great friend, chairman of the House Education, uh, the House Labor Education and Welfare Appropriations Subcommittee. He had the chair that Congressman Flood of Pennsylvania has now. Only Mr. Fogarty was a real fighter and he believed in legislation to help education and libraries and health. And he would just come into the meetings and say, we're going to have so much for libraries, and let's see what else do we need here. But he was a marvelous man. And when he died, 
libraries lost a real friend, and I know the people in health felt the same way. But when he came to our workshop, he was really hammering home the idea that libraries are tremendous, he was a self-made man, and that we ourselves didn't recognize how great they were. And he counseled us in that the educational product which libraries represent is more important and more attractive to legislators and to the public than even librarians themselves realize. You librarians, he said, need not and should not plead with hat in hand for a few dollars more than you received last year from your appropriating authorities. Instead, you should think bigger and better so that you can share your vision of good library service with all who use and support your institutions. And I'd like to close on that theme, having done the unthinkable and diverting myself from this prepared text entirely, and just say, let's keep Congressman Fogarty's words in mind. And despite everything that may seem to be working as against us in the next few months, remember that we have a big job to do and that we have to convince others what libraries are all about and help get them to help us do this job. And let's indeed think bigger and better so that we can share our vision of good library service with all who use and support our institutions. Thank you. Now, time out for our sponsor. I've brought with me something we call how to write a letter to your congressman. And I hope that you will pick up copies of this. And if we run short, maybe you can Xerox a few. And on the left side, it gives you a few reminders of things to do in writing to your congressman. On the right side, things to avoid. It uh, doesn't pay to insult a congressman or tell him that you're going to see that he gets voted out. The job we really have is to convince him to see the importance of libraries and to share our vision. The other thing that I have, I think, I hope many of you have already read, but it's a good piece to have in mind to show to your friends who don't know what library legislation is about. And this is a reprint from the January issue of American Libraries that Jerry Credick did, kind of wrapping up her 15 years of activity in the Washington office. And really what it is, is basically a highlight of federal library programs with some dollar amounts. And just to remind you what LSCA and HEA and ESEA is all about, so that when you're writing to your congressman or talking to people who come into the library, that you can tell them that libraries have a real problem in the coming months, as do all education programs, and that we need their support, their vote of confidence, and that we have to make them bigger and better. Thank you. Oh, questions? I thought perhaps I had worn you down to a nub, as Jerry used to say, but I certainly will be delighted to answer any if I can. Yes. I have two questions for you. First of all, uh, do you have anything on medical libraries in the store? And secondly, yeah. would it be better to back existing le legislation or to get on the bang wagon of new legislation? Uh, on medical libraries, to answer the first part of your question, the Medical Library Assistance Act, which also was enacted for the first time in 1965, 65 was really a banner year for education programs in general is due to expire June 30th and we thought we were going to be one up on this last year when Senator Kennedy introduced a bill and we supported that. In fact, we encouraged his uh, proposal to add on not just a one-year extension that he originally introduced but a four-year extension as the bill came through the Senate. Uh, the reason I say we had hoped is that legislation must go through both houses of Congress. 
this particular bill that he got through the Senate called for a four-year extension of many medical programs, including the Medical Library Assistance Act. However, with the rush to adjourn, the House just decided, I guess, uh, not to bother taking it up. And as a result, Senator Kennedy has reintroduced it. But as I understand it, uh, he's resigned himself to having just a one-year extension. And this is a problem because one year goes by so quickly and all the effort that goes into this. And it removes the element uh, the opportunity for long-range planning. So this, uh, I think, is just about ready to go to the Senate floor. In fact, I've lost track of the reading the record the last few days. It, it may have been up yesterday, but uh, in any case, it still will have to go to the House, and that's where the problem is. It has to go through the whole hearing stage, and with only about three months to go, there, uh, technically there is a problem there. And at the same time, the administration as you may know, is trying to do away with most of the categorical health legislation as well as education. So I think they're going to come up with a, a greatly reduced kind of consolidated program and whether medical libraries will share in that or not. But if you have a, a real concern for that program, do write to uh, your own member of Congress and ask him what's happening with it. Tell him of your concern. And this is something that you need to keep in mind. Uh, just because you don't have a member on the Appropriations Committee, and incidentally, Indiana has two members, one on the minority and one on the majority side of the House, and Senator By in the Senate who are on the Appropriations Committee, and they are people that should hear from you. But if you don't have a member on the particular committee that's considering a bill, write to your own member and ask him to lobby the fellow that's on the committee, whether he's from... Uh, this state or other states just ask them to speak to the chairman because they do that and uh, we're getting lots of carbons of letters uh, back and forth between librarians and congressmen where they say well as you know I'm not on this committee but I'm going to give your good information to the chairman and and this works because uh, uh, they're speaking to their peer group now the other part of your question is would you repeat it yes uh, would it be better to stick with the oh yes yeah. I would say that we always have to be open-minded and flexible, and uh, some great ideas can be out there in the making. So the really the crux of the matter is to recognize that we have perfectly good legislation on the books, if you're talking about other programs now than the medical library program, since that does need to be extended. But uh, let me use the Library Services and Construction Act as an example. We have an ad hoc group of state librarians who are kind of brainstorming right now, mostly because the Office of Education said, well, give us your good thinking on new thrusts, new direction, new delivery system, all those words they're using. And some of the other state librarians have been concerned, saying, well, what's this we hear, that there's somebody planning new kind of legislation? And that isn't it at all. But the thing is, we can't afford to just get stagnant and say, well, we've got everything we need. There's always a possibility that there are elements we've never considered before. But anything that's already on the books, such as the Library Services and Construction Act, which is working very well, uh, as many of you may know, that's been tremendously successful in generating state and local matching money, you know, and way up in the hundreds of percents that's it added dollars to states for library purposes. States that uh, had seven cents per capita, which is peanuts. <laughs> now they may have only a quarter, but it still is, percentage-wise, it's a great leap forward. So that you have to stop and think, uh, relatively speaking, they're important. And the LSCA is authorized through fiscal year 76. So what we need to be doing in the meantime is really thinking this through and saying, do we need a new kind of legislation? Do we need something that ties into satellites and cable TV? And does it take new legislation? Or uh, will LSCA cover that too? And you, we need to have a, a lot of brainstorming, uh, new kinds of librarians looking at this, uh, looking at it from an information science and automation point of view, looking at it from the traditional point of view, and really examining it and saying, can we do all of these new kinds of things with what we have, or do, do we need a new delivery system? But 
uh, it takes quite a while between the reason why we have a big program called whatever that would amount to interlibrary cooperation, bringing all kinds of libraries together, giving them sizable chunks of money so they could do something dramatic. The, the thing that's wrong about that program is uh, not the substance of it, but the lack of money that's been appropriated. As you know, if you've looked at appropriation tables, they've never had anything beyond uh, planning money. And you can plan just so long, and then you've got to get the road, uh, the show on the road. And this really has been the problem with that particular program, that it hasn't been given the kind of money it needs to do something dramatic to get the attention of the country and to show that there is a role for networking, for uh, cutting across jurisdictional lines, indeed transcontinental, intercon, you know, trans world. There isn't any limit if you've got good thinking and enough money and time. It takes time. You have to evolve something. Money isn't going to do it all, but it's got to be gradually worked over. So what I'm saying to uh, boil it down is that we need to do both things. We need to need to act more and more quickly in terms of getting something. They'll say, we're going to introduce your bill and get it underway, and we're going to have a morning of hearings. What well, used to be that they went at it in a little more careful fashion. And I think uh, this, again, reflects having the uh, executive of one party and the Congress majority of another party. They're always competing with one another. And it's up then to the Congress to introduce their own legislation. When the administration is introducing it, it's usually done in a more careful fashion if they've done one of the problems. But if you have enough time for a hearing and consideration of a bill, by all means, and you've got to admit, we librarians have a vested interest, and a congressman will be the first one to say, well, or uh, somebody from a friends of a library group, or just very enthusiastic library users. I'm, sometimes we've had three or four days of hearings. We've alerted all our friends in Washington representing the NEA. And if you go back and read some of those early uh, hearing records, you'll find a way to do it. But it, it takes time, and you also have to spend time explaining to the people who support it. And you may get people who don't want to, but uh, let them come to 